Welcome to A Course to Retirement with Grand Rapids Certified Financial Planner, Ron Courser. Ron Courser and Associates are planning today for the potential of tomorrow. And welcome into the program. This is your Course to Retirement, Grand Rapids, your resource for a common sense approach to planning for your financial investment and retirement future, making progress and showing us the way. He is certified financial planner, Ron Courser, president and founder of Ron Courser and Associates. Ron, thank you for being here as our resource. Well, good morning, Peter, and good morning to everybody listening to today's program. We've got an interesting one. I'm going to give it a title. I don't often do that. I'm going to give it a title and called Money in Motion. So on this program, we're going to talk about when it's appropriate to consider moving your money from wherever it is now to either another custodian, another kind of account. When is it appropriate? What are the things you have to take a look at or every advisor should make sure they look at before you make that decision? Because number one, if you're going to move your money, you want to make sure that the potential for improving your position is there. And number two, you don't want to make a mistake because sometimes uh, a making a mistake when you're trying to move your money from one custodian to another can become a catastrophic event in terms of taxation. So we're going to talk about that. When should clients be thinking about moving their assets to different locations, different accounts? And uh, there's at least eight different opportunities to think about it. We're going to cover all of them in some detail and maybe some other things that come up too during the program. So tune in, everybody. If you have questions, give me a call at 616-301-2581. That's 616-301-2594. That's the right code. That's the right one. You got a couple of lines there at the office. I, I know that one goes to the front desk and one is for the radio program. Uh, but 616-301-2594 is the, the one that we commonly talk about here on the show. Three, uh, 616-301-2594. Of the perpetually confused when it comes to phone lines. Forgive me for all of that, but make sure it ends in 9-4. Uh, and also, we've had more and more folks start to just uh, contact us through our website at www.roncourser.com. You can certainly do that, too. Uh, we will absolutely make contact with you uh, as quickly as possible to answer your questions and provide whatever help we can. So, Peter, if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get on with it. As my uncle in Tennessee says, we'll start to begin to commence to get on with it. Yeah, let's let's, let's proceed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, and and great website there, roncourser.com, roncourser.com. Lots of resources, old editions of the podcast. That's a great way to be in touch. Again, online, roncourser.com. But but Ron, generally we hear that investing is for the long term and, and buy and hold. And a lot of our retirement accounts are actually set up intentionally to be somewhat out of sight, out of mind. So either by design or intention or just as a result of the way that we are taught to invest, a lot of times I think people could miss these opportunities uh, or these moments in time when they should be considering moving their money. Yeah, that's a good point to make. And, and, and the whole idea of rebalancing on the surface seems to make sense. People say, well, if this is where I'm starting and whatever I'm invested in, uh, invariably one or two or three of those positions are going to do better than the other three or four. And, and you don't want to get too far out in front of your skis, so to speak, riding the wave of one. Because what I tell folks is understand, why, why do we invest? There's, I think there's two schools. One is the, the 85 to 95% where it says we invest to make money. And it, that seems like, wow, that's really deep, Ron. Yeah, I, that, that, that's the <laughs> point, Ron. Yes. Really yes. <laughs> now, now think about this. If we invest to make money, we understand that we have to pick a time to buy something. But the difficult part comes, when do we sell something? You know, you, you can have a mutual fund in your 401k. Maybe it's heavily invested in technology. It's had a really nice run up these past two or three months. So my question is, at what point in time do you want to make profit? And what I say by making profit, to make profit on an investment, it requires that you sell a portion of it or all of it to get the, to get the gain. So if you pay 10 bucks for a mutual fund, now it's gone to 20 bucks a share. Yeah, you, you have a gain. It's called an unrealized gain. But to make a profit, 
you actually have to do something. And that do something is you have to make a decision to sell some or all of it to get the gains. And that's one of the most difficult things people have to deal with is when do I sell a winner? Sometimes it's easier to say, when do I sell losers? And then we get into that other, what we call rule of thumb that says, well, I've had a loss in my mutual fund in my 401k or IRA. And sometimes I'll say, well, let's sell it. And, and once in a while, I'll hear the idea, well, if I sell it, that locks in the loss. And what I try to help folks understand is if you bought a stock or mutual fund for 10 bucks a share, and now it's only worth eight bucks a share, you've already, you already have the loss. The, 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 the loss call, has happened. <laughs> yeah, for, for, for tax purposes, if it's, a, if it's in a taxable account, it's called an unrealized loss, but it's still a loss. So on both ends, it's very difficult for investors to sell the winners, and it's sometimes equally as hard to sell the losers. All of that gets into the whole general idea of, let's call it rebalancing your portfolio. It's an interesting concept. Let's say you set up a portfolio that's going to be 70% stock, 20% bonds, 10% alternative investments in cash. That's your model for investing. And then over a six month period, let's say the stock portion goes to 80%. The question becomes, should you rebalance? And if so, how? So I'm going to talk about three different approaches to rebalancing and why you might want to do that. Ron, when, when we're talking about rebalancing here and, and the topic of this program is, is eight times or eight opportunities to, to move money or money in motion, um, this isn't necessarily, you're not talking here about having to change institutions, about having to move to different accounts. So this is actually motion potentially within the same account when you're talking about rebalancing. Absolutely. Within your 401k and IRA taxable account, it doesn't matter. Every account is set up with some basic model. And if you choose to say that that's the model I want to adhere to over a long period of time, it's going to get out of whack, either because of good stuff or bad stuff, which is going to create an opportunity or a reason to look at rebalancing to bring it back in line with your investment objectives. That's okay. what we're talking about. Yeah. So maybe maybe a bit redundant or, or restating or a stating of the obvious. But when you're talking about money in motion, within this particular example of money in motion, rebalancing doesn't require us to, to move money from where it is, but it is still a time where we need to pay attention and potentially make some movement with our money. And, and there's a couple of different ways of, 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 of which we can rebalance our accounts, Ron. Yeah, think about it. Uh, you have several ponds that you can go fishing in. So what we're talking about the rebalancing pond, if we're gonna stay in the same pond, we're just going to change maybe the bait or the lures we use to go fishing. Or farmers going to do crop rotation. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about this. There's about three types of rebalancing that we could talk about. The first is what we call strategic rebalancing. It's, it's taking wherever your portfolio has gone and moving it back to a predetermined allocation. And, you, and most people do this, if they, or they should do it on a regular basis because the, the allocation plan that you put together should reflect accurately your risk profile and your investment objectives. So strategic rebalancing just means we're going to every maybe six months or every 12 months, take a look at where we are versus our model and we're going to make any changes necessary to line up again with that business model. That Why do we need model. to do that on a regular basis, Ron? For two reasons. Number one, um, over time, if we assume that our investment objectives and risk tolerance doesn't change, the portfolio may get out of whack. First, with what we're comfortable with and what we want to accomplish. That's probably the, the biggest reason is that over time, an investment portfolio is it, it moves around a little bit, you know, within that pond, it, it keeps moving around. The fish get bigger, the fish get smaller. We have to figure out where we are right now. And does that still line up with where we wanted to be to begin with? So Ron, everybody, if I, it, so uh, I'm sorry, you know, apologize. an investment idea of, of, of risk and tolerance and what their objectives are, maybe for income, whatever. So does this portfolio, uh, if we take a look at it once a year, Sometimes people will do that. Does it still line up with where we want to be? And, and to bring it back in line, 
means that we're going to modify wherever risk is, we're going to modify that and bring it back to where we wanted to be, where we started off, because we're still comfortable with the risk. It's still going to produce potentially the results we want and potentially the income we're hoping for. So if I had begun my career, let's say I got into a 401k 10 years ago, and I decided that my comfort level dictates a 50-50 portfolio where 50% where is in stable or fixed income and 50% is in equities. And then the market had a fantastic decade. That probably means I'm then exposed to a higher degree of risk than my initial risk tolerance would indicate because the market side has done so well. Now I might be 80 or 90% in, in equities. Uh, and, and therefore, if there is a downturn, I would suffer greater losses than I'm comfortable with. And that's why that's we need to rebalance. Yeah, that's potentially true. And, and it gets back to the other part that we just talked about. When do you sell a winner? You know, if, if you start out with a 50-50 portfolio and over time, because you've had some great years, now it's 70-30, that just means that the stock portion has, has done really well. Mm -hmm. So when do you want to pull back? Not so much because you're frightened, but when do we take profits? That's part of the concept and part of the being wrapped up in, when do I rebalance? Do I want to take some profits? You know, I'll give you a great example. Uh, before the big collapse this past year, um, Amazon had a great run up. We had some clients that, that bought into it and uh, doubled their money. And then Amazon and the, and the collapse uh, went down about 45% very quickly. So think about this. And it's not called timing the market. It's determining when you should take profits. We had some clients that took some profits as it started to decline. And then we waited 31 days and we reinvested in that at a lower price and ended up buying more shares. That's an example of where this one stock in the portfolio just took off. And it, it, it represented a much larger percentage of the portfolio than what the client wanted or what made sense to them. So that was a strategic rebalancing, if you will, to get back to where they were. A second kind of rebalancing deals with what we call tactical rebalancing. What does that mean? It means conditions in the market have changed in somewhat strange fashion or who knows why. And what you made your investment decisions on, say a year ago, in the model and everything, the underlying reasons for making those decisions have changed because something's happened in the market. And some of us are going through that right now because it's a strange market we're living in, right? It has absolutely no relationship seemingly to the economy. There are certain segments of the stock market that are driving the market. For example, there are about five technology funds that account for over 25% of the movement in the S&P 500. If you think about that, you say, my goodness, what are the other 495 companies doing? A lot of them are underwater but it's the technology that's driving it. So somebody may make a decision saying, look, my strategy that I put together last year worked for a while and now it's not. Now I wanna make a tactical rebalance to more closely reflect not only what I want to accomplish, but what the market apparently is telling me where it's going. This is not, this is not market timing. It's not following the herd, so to speak, you know, and just trying to do day trading kind of things. It's saying maybe there's a fundamental change that's happened in the market right now. Markets change all the time. Some of it can be just goofy changes. Some of it can be what we consider to be fundamental change. So we may want to rebalance our portfolio a little bit to take advantage of that, always keeping in mind what our basic risk objectives are and what our basic long-term profit objectives are. So, so those are the first two, strategic and tactical. Strategic and tactical. And, and those really have to do, Ron, with <clears throat> the, the movements or the conditions that are inherent in the market. We know the market is going to move. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. One of those is, is fairly certain. And that's kind of the only guarantee <laughs> that we have with the market is, is that it goes up, that it goes down. We just don't know when. Or that conditions that would dictate what we anticipate is the direction of the market would change. Now, we want to be careful, obviously, not to try to time the market there. Uh, as you stated, that's, that's probably not a winner's game. But 
fundamentally, there may be some reasons to tactically rebalance the account. And then, Ron, the final one here really has to do with, with, with us personally rather than what the market is doing, correct? It really does. And that's just the time of life. What do I mean by that? Let's say that, uh, Peter, you're getting ready to retire uh, next June. You're, you've got a little less than a year to go, and you've made the decision that June 30th, you're out of here, so to speak. That may require, and it may feel very real to you, that, boy, get, what's going on in the market right now is kind of scary. I can't afford to take another hit like I did perhaps in March. So as you get close to maybe a milestone in your life, you may want to change the composition of your investment portfolio to more closely align with what we call timing, not timing of the market, but timing for a major change in your life. You're going to retire. A lot of people want to pull back on some of the risk or reallocate their portfolio to give them a little more peace of mind. And, and it often makes sense. You just rebalance inside of that account to, to conform to where you're going in life. Nobody wants to take, we talk about this, that issue of, of risk when it comes to sequence risk the risk of losing money two, three, four, five years before, right after retirement. It's a deadly risk. Nobody wants to be impacted by it. So those are the three reasons you may want to rebalance. Strategic because, you know, your account's done well and you want to get back to where it was. Tactical to take advantage of some things going on. And just the timing issue of where you are in life. So as a 30-year-old, I am probably much more aggressive than I would want to be at, at 50 or 60, and therefore optimizing my portfolio with my anticipated timeline is, is the yeah, final and reason. And I was understanding that, you know, one of the rules of thumb that you hear about in our industry, well, Peter, you're only 30 years old, you're young, you can afford to take a lot of risk. Why? Because you have that thing called recovery time. My question, if you choose to do that, is why would you want to expose yourself to more risk than you really need to, to meet your investment objectives? That's where I think the wheels come off of the idea that, well, I'm 30 years old, I can just let it rip. Yeah. I suppose you can, but the idea of losing in a, in a bad correction 50% of your money never makes sense to me. You can still be what we might call aggressive in a rational kind of way. Does that make sense? No, yeah, that, that's the premise and that's the theory, should you choose to accept it, but, but you still have to be willing to uh, accept that risk if, yeah, if that is the model you that you're, you're going to follow. Yeah. Again, rebalancing one of the, the, the key fundamentals to long-term success in investing. So set it and forget it, buy and hold forever and ever, ignoring accounts out of sight, out of mind with your 401k and your retirement dollars. These are not necessarily going to be as beneficial, as effective as they could be long-term. We have to pay attention to those accounts to, to some extent. And rebalancing is, is one of those areas where we do need to pay attention to those accounts in order to have effective long-term success. And Ron Corser can help you review and evaluate your accounts, see where you are getting that kind of attention, see where you, you may be out of alignment and, and have not been rebalancing as, as often as you should be. Pick up the phone, give a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594, 616 And Ron, before we move on to the next one, I just want to clarify that you do help your clients and savers and investors um, look at accounts and at least give some kind of guidance, even with accounts that you do not directly control, like the 401ks. You, yeah. you can do that with them, right? Absolutely. And I recommend that. And because most of the time, what we hear from our, our, our current clients, where we mean new people, when I ask them about their, their investment strategies and the kind of help they've gotten from their 401k advisory group, it's, it's minimal. And we all know that. And the reason for it there could be 20,000 people in a 401k plan with a big corporation. It's very hard to give really tailored advice. So what I hear sometimes is, well, I, the guy comes by, he's a nice guy, he spends 15 minutes with me and changes things around. I still don't know what I own. So one of the things we can help people is we can do a really in-depth dig, kind of an analysis into what their 401k plan is holding, what their investments are, and does it line up with what they have? And we try to show them what they really own. It's important to understand that. 
what do you well, really own inside of those mutual funds? And we can help with that. So give us a call. It's one of the services we provide. We think it's a, it's a great value add, so to speak, for your life. You get an extra pair of eyeballs to take a look at what is it I own? Does it make sense to keep owning it? Am I doing the right thing for me? Because this is all about 401k investing your way, not their way. Absolutely. Well, let's make sure that, that we understand what we hold, that we've got a strategy, even with those employer-sponsored plans. It, it's not just make the lines add up to 100% and, and then continue to throw money in uh, throughout your career. You do need some more proactive, ongoing monitoring. And there is time, even within the account, where money should be in motion. So again, if you need any help, get that help, get that assistance, get that perspective from a certified financial planner. Give Ron Corser a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594. Ron, what's another time when money should be in motion, or at least we should consider maybe some motion well, this, with our money? This to me is a good one. This, I love this one, talking about this. It talks about Roth IRAs and Roth conversions. Uh, for strategic planning purposes, people may want to consider converting some of their tax-deferred accounts uh, most commonly IRAs, 401ks, if they can do it, to a tax-free Roth account, Roth IRA. Now, <clears throat> a lot of times people look at their IRA money, and maybe they have $500,000 in it, and they say, well, I can't convert that. The taxes would kill me. And my response is, yes, if you try to convert all $500,000, uh, you'll probably get a thank you letter from the, the IRS for the contribution you've made to taxes. <clears throat> but Roth IRAs can be it's a strategic issue, but they can be what we call systematic. It doesn't have to be an all or none situation. In fact, rarely have I run into a situation where when we do the Roth conversion for our clients, it's an all or nothing. That is very rare. Most of the time, we create a Roth conversion strategy. And what do I mean by that? We take a look at where their tax situation is now, where they're going to be over the next one, three, and five years. So let's say somebody's 55 years old or and they, and they have an IRA and they want to convert it. The first thing you need to know is that when you do a Roth conversion, you don't, you're, you're not subject to that 10% early withdrawal penalty. It's strictly a tax issue. So the way to do it is really simple. You take a look at where your tax uh, return is. Are you going to be about the same this year as next year? And where are you in terms of the brackets? We can help develop a strategy that says, look, I got a half a million dollars in my IRA I'm 55 years old. When I get to be 65, I plan on retiring. I want that whole half a million dollars to be Roth money. We can actually create a strategy for you to do that that minimizes the taxes or makes your tax bill the least possible given whatever the current rules are. And, and ultimately you get to the point where you say, I've taken money that's going to be taxed like crazy forever. With what the governments are doing, the state and local, uh, I just tell folks that the probability of it paying more in tax in different ways is, is pretty great. So the more we can do now, the better off we're going to be because the tax brackets are still reasonably low. So keep in mind, it's not an all or nothing. It really requires, and if folks have a, a CPA they want us to work with, we do that. We allow that, and when I do this, I call kind of a pre-tax potential pretend plan. I mean, I do it in my own life. What I do is I give our CPA, here's what's going on in our life. This looks like what we're going to do this year, uh, figure out my tax liability. And number two, I want to convert some more money from our IRA to a Roth. What is that going to cost me? Because there's a cost and that's called the tax. You're going to pay tax on it in the current year. Nobody likes to pay more in taxes. The CPA, his head will spot, probably explode because you're paying more in tax. I get that. I mean, these are great people, right? Their whole world is built around reducing taxes. And that, I think that used to make great sense. I'm just not sure five or 10 years from now, what we pay in tax is going to go down. In fact, I'm convinced they don't, but that's just my own opinion. So if we can create a Roth IRA strategy, what that does is down the road, it gives you flexibility in terms of how you're going to handle your annual tax bill. So let's say you never do a Roth. You have a half a million dollars out of retirement and you thought about it 10 years ago and never did anything about it. Okay, now you need $20,000 a year out of your IRA to make up for your, whatever the deficits you have and what you need. 
So to get that 20, you may have to take out 25,000. What that does potentially is it impacts the amount of your social security that can be taxed. It certainly can impact the amount you pay in your Medicare Part B because that's based on income from two years ago. Right. So by not doing anything five or 10 years from now, it may cost you more in this example. On the other hand, if you had, even if you took Peter, your half a million and over the next 10 years, we converted half of it. So let's don't worry about growth. Let's just say now I have 250,000 in IRA, 250,000 in Roth IRA. I need 20,000 a year for some reason. Now you can say, well, I could take it from my Roth that doesn't change my tax liability at all. Or I could take some from my IRA and some from my Roth to minimize the tax. The Roth IRA gives you a sense of freedom in terms of how you're gonna manage your tax bill. Because without a Roth IRA, there, there are very few options you have in managing the tax bill. And managing taxes in retirement, we've talked about this. Taxes are gonna be one of the biggest expenses we have in retirement. And then you're gonna put on the Medicare bill and the tax on social security. So what a Roth does, it gives you flexibility, but it gives you freedom. I mean, I get really excited about these Roths. I really do because I think I see that freight train coming down the road. Um, and I don't see how we get out of this mess that we've gotten ourselves into when it comes paying for all the stuff that's going on. You know, it's not a political statement. Somehow we got to figure out how to finance it on this, even on the state and local level. That's why Roth accounts are going to be the most wonderful, from my point of view, kinds of accounts we can hold going forward. Uh, agreed on on that sentiment. But, uh, you know, it's all about flexibility and control here. And the bottom line is with tax deferred accounts, we do not have as much flexibility or control. And, and so much of our outcome is determined by the level of control we can take over certain variables. What tax rates may do into the future is an assumption that we make in the plans. It is a variable that is going to determine our outcome. And we are not in control of that factor. So uh, again, this is a time we are talking about uh, moments when money should be in motion, moving money and the consideration for a Roth conversion potentially is one in your circumstances where money should be in motion. We're going to talk about uh, several more here. Ron Corser, certified financial planner, has a list of at least eight times when money should be in motion. We've, we've covered two of them so far. So the second half of the show is going to be jam-packed, ladies and gentlemen. Don't go anywhere, but we've talked about rebalancing those accounts, the potential for Roth conversion. Uh, six more to come uh, when we come back here on your course to retirement. Again, if you would like to sit down with a certified financial planner, identify if you've got any accounts that should potentially be in motion or, or are there ways that you could be more efficient and effective with your dollars and, and leverage their purpose to you, pick up the phone, give Ron Corser a call, 616-301-2594. That is 616-301-2594. 616-301-2594. Quick break. We'll be back with more in just a moment. And we're back here on your course to retirement. Grand Rapids, your resource for a common sense approach to planning. And our resource here on the program is certified financial planner, CFP, president and founder of Ron Corser and Associates. Ron Corser with us as always. Today on the program, talking about money in motion. When should we be considering or identifying opportunities to move our money? When is it appropriate to make changes with our accounts and with our investments? When should money be in motion? Uh, these are key opportunities to identify. And Ron Corser is a certified financial planner, again, providing us with that perspective. If you've got questions or concerns, if you'd like this list, pick up the phone, give a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594. If you have an opportunity or can identify that maybe you should be considering moving money, if you'd like to sit down for a complimentary strategy session, again, that number, 616-301-2594. So Ron, we talked about rebalancing accounts. We talked about Roth conversions. And we've got six others on your list here of moments where that money should be in motion. So let's get to it. Let's get to it. The next one is when you get to be 59 and a half. That's a magical time. Uh, magical time in terms of money, maybe not in terms of age. But at 59 and a half, most 401k plans allow the option uh, 
by law, everyone does, but it's up to the plan, to move your money from your 401k or 403b into your own self-directed IRA. Now, why would you want to do that? Perhaps you have uh, some level of dissatisfaction with the investment options you have in your company plan. By moving it into an IRA, you open yourself up to a whole world of new investment options. Uh, they give you the, the opportunity to tailor your, your strategy to what really suits you. Because think about it, in 401ks, they're designed to give us long-term savings opportunities over time, but it's, it's almost like a one size fits all. Yes, everybody may have 10 different mutual funds, but maybe you wanna do something else. Maybe you need more income producing, any number of reasons, or maybe you just want more control. You know, you don't have to be subject to the control or the rules within a 401k when it comes to taking money out. So there are a lot of reasons. 59 and a half uh, is the key time. You can start to look at it. Most companies allow at least some, some all, and there's a few companies that the plan simply doesn't allow it. You have to move. You have to change jobs to get the money. But it's a good time to at least talk to an advisor. Talk to us about, look, I'm 59 and a half. I, I guess I can move some money. Why would I want to do that? What kind of things would I be looking for? Can you help kind of shape the discussion? Tell me what's out there, what I can do or not do, what makes some sense, so we can cobble together a really fine structured investment plan for you that meets your investment objectives and your risk objectives, perhaps better than your current 401k plan is. So 59 and a half is a good time to to talk about that. So Ron, you actually, when, when I heard you state this and when I saw this, I was actually thinking that you meant 59 and a half at that point in time, you could take income from these accounts. That is, that is also true, but you're saying that there's reason why at 59 and a half, maybe just to consider repositioning accounts, even if you don't necessarily need the money and some potential advantage to doing so. Absolutely. You, you can still stay within, if, if you're still working for a company that has a retirement plan, the, the 59 and a half issue, we call it an in-service distribution. Sometimes it's called by different names. Still allows you to be a participant in the retirement plan of the company. You can still defer income. It's just you're moving a part of it out because you'd rather have a different set of investment options, different kind of risk parameter than you currently have with your 401k plan. That's the basic reason to do it. And it gives you more control, which always makes sense. Well, again, control is, is the name of the game. That's what's going to determine our outcome. And if, if we want to make sure that we are determining what that outcome looks like, taking control over certain variables, certainly going to be advantageous. And, and at age 59 and a half, another one of those opportunities where we might consider moving money. If you want to make sure that you're identifying these opportunities and when you have that you're doing things correctly with intention and not any unintended consequences, pick up the phone, give Ron Courser a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594. So Ron, at 59 and a half, maybe that opportunity to take control of those 401k assets, even while still at a job, still working, still contributing to the plan with new money, taking the old money in and doing other things with it. Uh, another one on your list though, is when we have left a job, we've got that opportunity as well and, and probably should. Yeah, yeah. No, normally when people leave a job, they move their, their 401k plan. Now the rules say that you can move from one 401k with your former employer, you can move it into your new employer's retirement plan if he has one. That's, that's an easy transfer, you can do that. But what are the situations where perhaps you may not wanna do that? A lot of times when people leave a company, they wanna roll their, their, their 401k or 403b over to an IRA and it gets back to the issue of control. They just want it out of the company plan. They don't wanna be subjected to whatever rules or limitations within that company plan. They wanna control the money themselves in their IRA and develop an invest investment plan. There's another reason to leave it in, not out, but to leave it in the account. And this is really critical. If you're 55 years old and we're seeing more of this in this COVID-19 thing, if you've, received, if you've gotten to be the age 55 and you get let go from your company that has a 401k plan, a retirement plan, would it be rational to leave your money in that plan? And the answer is perhaps yes. So that may sound strange coming from an advisor, but here's the rule. When you're 55 
and you have a, what's called a separation of service from your company plan, you can leave the money there as long as the company will let you. And you, you can begin taking money out of that and you're not 59 and a half, remember, where that 10% early withdrawal penalty goes away. But if you leave the money in the 401k, you can start to withdraw money out of it and not be subject to that 10% early withdrawal issue. It's really critical. It really is because if you're 55 and you move it to an IRA and then try to access it, unless you do one or two complicated things, you're going to be subject to a 10% early withdrawal penalty on that. So it's really important to understand that, and, and we're, we've had a couple situations this has happened. The best thing to do is leave it in the company plan because you can access that money until A, you either find another job or B, you decided this is what I'm going to do and that's how it's going to work. So that's a key issue. There's another key issue involved, not so much to taking money out, but you have to understand if you have a company retirement plan and you have publicly traded stock from the company, there's, a, there's something called net unrealized appreciation, NUA. It's very important. So let's say you have a comp company stock that you've been there for years and the average cost is 10 bucks a share and the company stock is 100 bucks a share and you wanna keep that stock. Well, you have to do an all or nothing. You roll the whole plan out and you separate that company stock. You put it into what's called a taxable account. Here's the key. The only part that's gonna be taxable if you do that this year is going to be what you paid in cost. So you have shares that have an average cost of 10 bucks, but now the company stock is at 100. You can actually keep that stock and you're just going to get hit with that $10 a share tax bite. That very, very important. Potentially really significant is. tax saving there. It really Ron. is because when you go to sell that stock, it's automatically considered a long-term gain. Yeah. So and, and we've been- what your in, I'm sorry, depending on what your income is, you may pay zero tax on that long-term gain. Yeah. We've been, we've been told that perhaps it's not the best of all ideas to invest in our company, in our retirement plan. Uh, and I can think of a, a couple examples, uh, Nortel and Enron and Tyco, uh, where that played out uh, very, very poorly for, for certain individuals. But what you're saying here is, while we shouldn't invest everything within our company, there might be some advantage to having some company stock in the plan. Yeah. And you may decide as the investor that you don't want to keep the company stock. That's a fair assessment to make. But you need I'm leaving the company. They're going to go downhill for sure from here. <laughs> you know, that may be. That may be because you have inside information. But it's always an important issue, not just let's just roll it over. Uh, you don't want to lose out on the potential tax benefits. So those are two important things to consider if you're under uh, 59 and a half and at least 55 when moving uh, your retirement account because of a separation from service. But, but generally, it is the advice the majority of the time that if you leave a company to take your money with you, and, and the basic reason for that, Ron, is, is so that it's not ignored, so that it's not forgotten about, correct? That's true. And, and, I'll, and there's another little, little smidgen here, and that is this. I've had, I've had experienced it a couple times. Uh, we know now that there's a lot of companies that are struggling. We know that. When a company goes through bankruptcy, everything gets locked up and shut down. When a company gets sold, you go through a blackout period. What that means is that there's a couple instances where you may not have legal access to your money until the process is completed. Because it's not your plan, you're a participant in the company's right. plan. Right. In a so 401k. That may be another reason. I mean, even some big companies are struggling. That may be another reason. It doesn't happen a lot, though. I mean, that is probably one of the least of the things we should worry about, but it is something that's out there. All right, Ron, uh, continuing on with our list here. And again, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about money in motion, moments in your financial progress where money should be moving. And if you've hit any of these key milestones or opportunities uh, and, and you want to make sure that you're doing things properly, not uh, any unintended costs or, or consequences and that you are positioning things in the optimal way to achieve your goals, pick up the phone, give certified financial planner Ron Corser a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594. Ron, next on the list, we have discovered we're paying too much. Our fees are too high. Yeah, that's an interesting concept to talk about because when we see it on paper on a relative basis, the fees 
I mean, you're not paying 3% fees like they used to in the old 401k plans. But here's what, I, here's what I try to help folks understand. When it comes to fees, there's two issues. One is cost, just flat out cost. The other is value. So sometimes, you know, there's that concept that somebody knows the cost of everything and the value of nothing. So one of the key decisions in leaving money or moving money out of a retirement plan is to determine, are you getting a bang for your buck in terms of advice, investment options, and help? Nothing is done for free in this world. There's somebody paid for it somewhere. And when it comes to investing, you know, even with these ads that say, well, buy our, our exchange traded fund, we have zero transaction charges, zero commissions. Trust me, there's a little bit of a cost built into that. Nothing is free. So the, a key decision is to say, how much am I really paying in my 401k plan? They become more transparent over the last few years. And given what I'm paying, is it worth the cost? Think about this. If you're paying a half a percent, I don't know what it might be, and you're getting absolutely no advice and you need advice, are you paying too much if you're not getting your bang for the buck? If on the other hand, you're perfectly comfortable with it, then, then it makes it easy to say, well, that's not the only reason I'm gonna think about changing. So the fees are important, but you also have to say, what am I getting for the fees? Everybody in this world charges for what they do. If you go to work for a company, you're basically charging for your labor. If you're a CPA, you're charging me, if you're my CPA to do my taxes, there's a charge to that. There's a charge to everything. And we always have to figure, am I getting the bang for my buck? Am I getting what I needed? And is it worth the cost, the value that I received? So that's where I go with fees. And everybody has to decide if they're too high, too low, or in between. Well, even even a 1% difference in fees or or on the other side of it, Ron, for safer money in interest rates, 1%, maybe over the course of a short period of time might not make a huge impact or might not seem like the biggest of deals, but compounding over the course of five years, 10 years, 20 years in time, that can that can set us well off of course. Well, here's, here's how I might make an analogy. If you put money in the bank, let's say you put $100,000 in the bank in a CD, maybe right now, maybe Lord willing the crick don't rise, you're gonna get a 1% rate, okay? And we assume there's no other costs there, but there are. Well, compare the 1% on 100,000 for a year versus an investment strategy that has a, a distribution rate of 5.5% on that 100,000. You're gonna pay, you know, whatever those assets kick off and dividends and interest, say 5.5, but you pay 1% to get that from an advisor. Is that a good deal? I go to the bank, I seem like I get free 1%, I'm gonna make $1,000. I put it somewhere else. Yeah, there's a little more risk involved, but maybe I can get five and a half percent. And this is just an example, ladies and gentlemen. So I have the potential to earn $5,500 in interest and dividends and stuff. Is that worth a 1% charge from a financial advisor? You know, everybody <laughs> has to make the decision. Yep. So let's keep moving on. Here's another great reason to, to make a change in where you are. You have an underperforming account. Okay. You have, you have investments in the 401k or your IRA that are not, they're not doing what you want them to do. Yep. Now there may be a lot of reasons for that. In the middle of March this year, nothing was doing what we wanted it to do because the market was going down 31% in 22 days. Well, well, and I think that's a great point Ron, because when you said underperforming, I actually thought of this in two, in, in two different aspects. The market is rising and I'm not keeping up the way that I feel like I should, or the market is falling and I've lost more than I was comfortable with, right? It's, it's yeah. both sides there. That's a good way to look at it. And, and sometimes people say, well, I'm not keeping up with the market. And then your question becomes, well, what was the initial investment strategy? So for example, <clears throat> if you want to keep up with the market, there's really limited options. You've got to get into an S&P 500 fund because that's the market, right? Right. Or a NASDAQ 100 fund or something like that. 
if you want to keep up with the market and if you have to have the market, you have to go for the gusto. But understand, even with a mutual fund or an, uh, an iShare, there's always going to be a little piece that's going to make it impossible for you to get the market. But if you want all the market, by definition, that means I want all the upside. And unfortunately, I have to take all the downside. So if you have a portfolio that has, say, 60, the number of 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and other things, it, it really doesn't, it, it, to get the market, you're not going to get the market with that kind of portfolio, even in a great year, because you're not fully invested in the stock market. So when you say, I want to I get the market, it, it really helps to work with an advisor who will kind of clarify it. What does that really mean? What does that really mean to you? I want all the market. Okay, what, you want all the downside? No, I don't want any downside. I want principal protected money. I want to get all the market and I want it to come out tax free. And I just say, you know what I do too. And when I find one, you'll be the first guy I call. So, so that's the other part about performance. In performance, if you agree on what's acceptable to begin with, what a realistic goal is, then you can figure out if, if what you're getting makes sense. So for example, on the 1st of January, if we created a portfolio for you and the goal, given your needs for income and everything else, you just wanted 4%. If you could get 4% this year, you're going to be in hog heaven, right? So for the first seven weeks of the year, your account probably earned 14. Oh, you're doing better. And then this COVID thing hit and everything reversed. So this 4% account ended up losing in that first quarter, 5%. Nobody likes a loss, but the market went down 22 and your account only lost five. Would that be a good thing? Hmm. Most people would say, yeah, I hate losses. I get it. But, but you have to kind of evaluate where you're going and what the goal was. If you don't know what the investment goal is, how are you going to know if you're meeting it, whether it's up or down? So to say that I want the market, you have to make sure that that's what you're invested in. Uh, if you want more than a market, you got to do some cute things and go for the gusto and hope it doesn't backfire. But it, it's key to just take a look at performance. So what does performance mean? Yep. We've and talked a lot about it on this program. Um, you know, the people want all of the market with no downside. That's not going to happen. It really is important to say, what is my, starting on the 1st of January, when I did a review with Ron Corser, what was our investment objective? What was our goal? And, and looking back now, does that goal still, still make sense, even though the market's been up and down and sideways? Yep. Does that make sense? No, defining that goal, absolutely. We've got to do that ahead of time. We've got to have realistic expectations for what that goal means as far as what kind of movement we expect to see in our account. And given enough time, maybe not knee-jerk reaction on the very first market movement, but given enough time, if we find that our account is not performing as expected or is underperforming either in our goals for growth or in our goals for for safety and preservation, then it may be a time to consider. And again, Ron, not knee-jerk reaction the first time, uh, but if it's consistent and over time, may be a reason why to consider uh, money in motion moving either within the account, we can, we can assess rebalancing, or maybe uh, that advisor is not necessarily, or that particular account is not necessarily meeting our goals and expectations. Again, reasons to consider money in motion. And if you'd like to analyze and review your accounts, pick up the phone, give Ron Corser a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594. Uh, any, any additional thoughts on that, Ron, or are we ready to move on to- I, I think we're good with that, yeah. All right, so the next, next- one I wanted to talk about is what, what would cause you to make a change? Well, maybe your time horizons changed. Maybe retirement's closer today than it was. Maybe something's happened to your health which has reconsidered, caused you to reconsider what, what you wanted to do going forward. There's a lot of reasons, there really are, uh, to make some changes because the time horizon has changed. And we've you seen mean, a lot of that this year, Ron, where people's pardon? time horizons changed as a result of, of circumstances. Oh my goodness, we've had clients that are under 60 that have been separated from their job and they were, re 
you know, their retirement goal was 66 or 67. That that's made a great difference. And we'd have to, to manage through that potential catastrophe. Time, time to time to rebalance. Maybe money should be in motion. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. It, you know, it, it, maybe just maybe you're not comfortable at all where we are today as a country. I'm not talking about the politics. I'm talking about economically. You know, today's economy, the stock market keeps wanting to go up. And we keep hearing these horror stories about the economy. Companies having trouble, uh, commercial real estate, more. There was an article I read today about New York City. And in San Francisco, another one, rents have come down almost 11% in the last month. That's amazing when you think about it. We yeah. pay $3,000 for a 300 square foot flush toilet and a Murphy bed. So times are changing and, and it may be that your time horizon has changed. So that's another reason to take a look at where you are and is there an option out there that might be more suitable. I, I heard a saying, Ron, that the markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So oh, if, we're, <laughs> if we are yeah. waiting on the markets to, uh, to come back to reality, we might be waiting a little longer than we can afford to. Next on your list here, wrapping things up on, on the uh, money in motion, moments where we should consider moving, consolidating accounts. And Ron, we've always heard, don't keep all your eggs in one basket, but there's a time and a place to tidy things up and, and, and kind of consolidate within our financial lives. Yeah, and that always makes sense. I, I believe that. About, it's called the, the diversification issue. But you can have six IRA accounts. You just have to manage them and perhaps pay six different IRA fees to manage them and keep them all over, there's still one big IRA. And just because it's in six different places, you may be duplicating what you're actually invested in. That does not necessarily mean you're diversified. Yeah, that's a great point. And most times there is duplication. It's pretty hard to avoid. It really is. Uh, so to have a lot of different accounts, some people are more comfortable. You know, my mom, I dearly loved her. She was a depression baby. And she had 16 different bank accounts because she didn't trust the banks. <laughs> I mean, was, she was, she actually went hungry as, as a child and, and she had them all over. And I kept saying, mom, we don't know where all your accounts are because she used to always buy CDs, where was given the highest interest rate and giving away a toaster or waffle iron or something. And, and she had 16 of them when she passed away, when she died. Wow. I thought we had all of them. Six months later, I got notice after we had closed her little estate that one of her CDs just renewed at a bank that I never knew. <laughs> so I, I had to go to the bank. I said, S I'm squirreled died. away. <laughs> yeah, she died six months ago. Here's a death certificate. Uh, so that was my mom's, and, and I understood that. I really, and I still understand it with, with people who were scarred like that. I do. It, it just, they just want to have it spread out. But when it comes to your investment strategies, it's, it's kind of counterproductive to have six different accounts. I, I know that some people will say, well, this account is for my cottage, and this account is for my grandchildren, and this account is for my grandchildren, great-grandchildren. People do that. I get that in terms of estate planning. But generally, when it just comes to my wife and me, you know, to have six or eight different accounts doesn't make any sense. It just makes it more difficult to manage. And it's very hard to avoid duplication of investment strategies or risk. So consolidating accounts always makes some sense from a management point of view, even from a cost point of view, it can make a big difference. Well, we have been talking about money in motion on today's program, and there are strategic moments in your financial progress when we should appropriately consider moving our money. And if you've reached any of those milestones uh, or need help identifying if you have, give Certified Financial Planner CFP Ron Corser a call if you'd like this list. Again, if you missed any of the program, would like to recap on the eight moments that uh, money should be in motion or where you should consider it. Pick up the phone, give Ron Corser a call. 
301-2594, and uh, aside from Money in Motion, there are a number of reasons why we need the help, the guidance of a qualified financial professional to help us maximize potential benefits like social security, to understand our tax liability, to assess the amount of risk that we are taking versus what we are comfortable taking. Ron Corser offers you the opportunity to address all of those and more in that complimentary review, that forensic and holistic look at your situation, the strategy session. Pick up the phone, give a call, 616-301-2594, 616-301-2594. Uh, Ron, an, another informative program. I, I, I liked the theme of today's show. Thank you for bringing all of these moments that money should be in emotion to our attention. It's be fun. And I, and I always go back to the concept when I've talked to some people and they say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get together with you, Ron, as soon as I get around to it. And I thought, I've got several round to it's in my garage right now. So don't <laughs> wait for another round to it before you give us a call, ladies and gentlemen, 616-301-2594 or go to our website, www.roncourser.com. We'll set up a time to chat, see if we can help you. I believe we can. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Certified financial planner, Ron Corser, standing by as your resource. Never any benefit to procrastinating or, or waiting till you can get around to it. Go ahead and give him a call now. 616-301-2594. We'll talk to you next time on your course to retirement. Tune in to Ron Corser's full radio program, A Course to Retirement, Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. on WOOD and visit roncorser.com for many valuable resources, including other great episodes of Your Course to Retirement. The content of this radio show is provided for informational purposes only and is not a solicitation or recommendation of any investment strategy. You are encouraged to seek investment, tax, or legal advice from an independent professional advisor. Any investments and or investment strategies mentioned involve risk, including the possible loss of principal. Advisory services offered through Brookstone Capital Management, a registered investment advisor. Annuity guarantees are based solely on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the issuing company. Withdrawals of growth from annuities may be taxable as ordinary income in the year it is taken. Individuals should review contracts for specific details of the product's features and costs. Early withdrawals may subject the owner to penalties, fees, or taxes. Fiduciary duty extends solely to investment advisory advice and does not extend to other activities such as insurance or broker-dealer services. Advisory clients are charged a quarterly fee for assets under management, while insurance products pay a commission, which may result in a conflict of interest regarding compensation.